Do we have Matthew Hardy from Adobe? He's really uh, specializing in structured publishing, structured documents. I think he's even done a PhD thesis on it. And he will probably say a few words about that as well. So it's re he's re really into structure. And, and he's going to, to, to explain a few things about uh, what, what Tech PDF is and what it might look like at some next level. And, and so just to, just to expand a little on what Olaf said, um, th this presentation is intended to both uh, complement uh, Def's presentation. It has a little bit of overlap, some clarifications. Um, Def did a fantastic job of, of covering a lot of topics, but it was a short period of time to talk in. And so I wanted to make sure that I, I you know, sort of covered some of these things. But one of the, th one of the interesting sort of aspects of Tag PDF and PDF UA is the background behind it. And it, it, once you understand a little bit about where it comes from, I think it helps you to understand some of the challenges and limitations uh, in the system. So I intend to talk a little bit about the background of it, a little bit about what Duff already spoke about, um, expanding on a few other topics. And, and there is some overlap there. I wasn't sure how many people would, would, would stay on from session to session. And then I want to talk about some of the things that the ISO 32000 committee proper, not the PDF UA committee, have been looking into as part of PDF 2.0 and some of the concerns we have with um, the, the direction we've been taking and some of the challenges that we're, we were not yet addressing. I'm, I'm being... You don't too? Don't, don't look at me, man. Not, everything's great. Uh, <laughs> you look panicked there for a second. No, I almost choked in my coat. Oh, okay, like, that's okay. <laughs> trust me, don't worry. <laughs> so... I already looked at your slides. They look great. <laughs> <laughs> so why am I even talking to you about this? So... Um, about 12 years ago, I, I started a PhD in uh, document structure and semantic analysis. Um, it wasn't specific to PDF. It was looking at how uh, documents are rep represented in XML, in PDF, in, in multiple technologies, and how you could accurately analyze uh, content and, 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 and compare it and, uh, and validate it. And it, it was actually sponsored by Adobe Systems. I should, <laughs> I should say that because um, so a lot of the, the research was into how you took SGML and XML based documents and, and, and formats and you converted them to PDFs and successfully round trip structure between those. Um, uh, I've also spent a couple of years working with a small startup based out of Amsterdam whose job was to do semantic analysis of newspapers, which is a particularly challenging field because newspapers are quite complex, but they're also reasonably structured. And so th that's my background. It's why I'm the, the tag PDF person. Um, and I've now been working in Adobe, uh, at Adobe in the Acrobat Engineering Group for about six and a half years. Um, at Adobe, I'm, I'm considered a PDF expert. I, um, I'm familiar with, we, we did a conversion of PDF to an XML format. We, I'm familiar with the digital signatures, and I'm not going to bore you with all of these, these, these topics, but um, I have a reasonably rounded knowledge. Um, I don't know anything about color or transparency, and I, I prefer to keep it that way. So um, I'm an ISO committee member. I'm on the PDF reference committee as well as the AE and UA committees and I, I take a very active role I think in the UA committee which is but this talk is not specific to UA it certainly touches on it but I'm also bringing it from the full ISO 32000 perspective so what am I actually going to talk about then I've already kind of gone over this to some extent I want to I want to address the history of type PDF just to clarify some understandings there and, and why we care about document semantics and, and some of this has already been covered um, I then want to talk a little bit more about creation and how you approach creating tag PDF uh, at a technical level, not, not so much at the semantic level, because Duff's already talked very much about that, and some common issues we see. And then I want to talk to you about the future of, of, of this material and, and how you know, we're trying to address challenges in the space of, of, of document semantics. So, as everyone here knows, PDF was, was created, PDF 1.0, which, which Adobe created, uh, was intended to, to basically do uh, page isolation in, uh, for PostScript. Um, it was entirely aimed at the print market, um, and it was all about getting uh, graphical objects painted to a display in any order such that they gave the final appearance as you wanted it. And so all the structures in, in the content streams for PDF are, are based around the idea that you paint something to a canvas. There's no concept of um, semantics, in, in it, or there was no concept of semantics in the first version of PDF. And so it's something that's been designed after the fact. And that probably explains a lot about the approach we took 
in, in adding that capability. So um, I have a little example on the screen on the, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, which is basically just showing a, a bit of text being drawn to the screen. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with sort of the, the underlying uh, content uh, nature of PDF, but you know, it, it really is just a matter of painting something and hoping it's right. And in this case, the content order would be correct, but there's no reason that that's going to be true um, for, 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 for general documents. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Jeff's already pointed this out, but you know, it's, it's perfectly um, reasonable that if I wanted to, to write some characters and then some more characters in a second color, I might paint those as two separate content streams. There'd be nothing to stop me doing that in PDF. And as we discussed just, just a few minutes ago, you know, relying therefore on content order is just something you cannot do. Another example um, is for at least traditional printing, um, gutter hopping, where you basically, to get good alignment on, on, on columns, you, you painted them in order so that the, the printer didn't have to go down one side and then, then back up and the other side. It's less common these days, but it's still, still something you see. And it's also not uncommon to have you know, body text in one font, headings in a second font, and to paint those in whichever order you choose. So there are many legitimate reasons for content to not come in reading order. And these are not supposed to be an exhaustive list. This is just a couple of you know, arbitrary examples of, of why this might happen. So how did PDF address this? Well, we introduced this concept of marked content in uh, PDF 1.2. And the idea behind marked content was that you could identify sequences of content on the page um, using inline operators, and, and I've highlighted the, the two cases where if you look at the example, it's the same as before, but now I've put some, some marked content around the actual text. And this helps me to identify it. But when we built marked content, there was still no concept of logical structure. It was more for workflow processing and allowed people to put private metadata into the content stream. And the most important aspect of this was that it did not disrupt the rendering in any way, shape, or form. So the idea was that this is metadata on the page. In PDF 1.3, we introduced the concept of logical structure. This is very much related to tagged PDF, and this is something people get confused about. Tagged PDF is built on top of that, and I will talk to that in a minute. But logical structure allowed you to build a structure tree and then refer from, each, from leaf nodes in the structure tree to content on the page. Because um, uh, content can occur across multiple pages, and if you imagine a newspaper, something that I've always said I'm familiar with, you often have article continuations going across multiple pages. And so how do you model that if your marked content is on the page? So we came up with the model of having a standalone structure tree that references content. A, a node can reference multiple content streams. The order is implicit in the logical structure, not on the page. And if it spans pages, that's fine. You just include more content from multiple pages, and that forms your logical content. Um, and you can still do all those print optimizations. There's nothing that stops you having something that's, that's optimized for doing printing, or because your authoring tool decided that it was a better way to, to produce that document. So that's logical structure. So finally, in PDF 1.4, we introduced this concept of tag PDF. And why did we do that? Well, there's a lot of different systems for doing logical structure. There's Dotbook, there's Daisy, there's, there's all these different SGML markups. You know, no one can agree on one set. And the most important aspect of PDF is document interchange. So if you're going to share your document with someone else, they have to be able to understand the structure that you have in there. And so we came up with the concept of the standard structure types. And so Tag PDF added a requirement that all content use the standard structure types. However, that would be way too limiting because here I have this fantastic document marked up in some, some SGML language that I want to convert to PDF. I really don't want to have to capture, I, I don't want to throw that all away and just put this standard structure type setting. So we, we added this capability to basically do um, role mapping. And that allowed us to basically say, here's my rich complex set. And this is how it maps to this reduce set that allows me to share this so that other people can get a basic understanding. And later, much later in the talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's not really sufficient and how we need to, to continue building on this mechanism. Um, and Tag PDF also wanted to address the, the idea of not just semantic sharing, but you, know, you have to be able to access the content. You have to actually be able to understand what you're processing in a machine-readable manner. If, if everything is just painting glyph IDs, 
there's no there's no understanding of what those actually might mean. So we had to put in mechanisms to do glyph ID mapping to Unicode and to support alternative text for uh, images and things like that. And so that's where a lot of this comes from. Um, and we also had to give you a way to mark content that shouldn't be real content. And that was what well, the artifact mechanism. So PDF UA, Let, let's get on to the actual uh, the track for a second. So ISO 32000 is a syntax specification. It doesn't try to mandate what you must do to produce any type of document. It gives you the syntax and the rules <coughs> to produce the documents that are appropriate for your use cases. So no one requires that all PDFs be tagged PDFs. And in closed workflows, if I'm, if I'm producing something that I want to print and I want to send a PDF to a printer, there's no reason if it's a closed workflow to even have tagged PDF in there. It just increases the file size. Um, and so you can't rely, as, as has already been commented, on, on tagged PDFs existing. So we wanted to put out a specification, and I was not uh, one of the founding members of the PDF UA committee, so I'm really much speaking to uh, Duff's uh, work. But the idea was to put out a specification that, that mandated the parts of the 32,000 specification that made good, reliable, accessible PDF, and to put a few extra restrictions on the content and requirements to make sure that it was actually useful to people. So that's the background. That's, that's the history of, uh, of all this. And I don't know if that was useful to anyone, but yeah, I think it sets the scene for, well, why is tag PDF and PDF UA the way it is? And the value of document structure and semantics is it goes far beyond just accessibility. And obviously, with PDF UA focus, our main focus is on accessibility. But for PDFs to be reprocessed or to be put into um, you know, document management systems, um, good semantics in your document, access to the content, is all necessary to, con to use that document as a living document that can continue its, it, it, its use. If it's not just going to a printer and coming out as a piece of paper, or sheets of paper, um, for, for that content to be reusable in the future, you need more than just glyphs and, and graphic operators. Um, but it does mean that if you know the nature of the content, you can navigate by that. And so we've seen that with the headings example, where you can navigate by headings or lists or find all the tables in a document. Um, and you can also rely on logical reading order, which is something that we've, we've talked about a lot. And it's why the difference between content order and logical order is, is very distinct. And, and that's the marked content mechanism that I've already described. And I should point out that it is the key to accessibility. You have to do this if you want an accessible document. Um, and, and I won't go into too much of this because I think the last two talks did a fantastic job of, of covering this topic. But you know, all of these are the benefits of, of, of access, the benefits to accessibility of good document semantics, tagged PDF and PDF UA. So I've talked a little bit about the history and hopefully not bored people too much with that. Um, I want to talk a little bit to creating tagged PDF and to understand uh, this is where I overlap a little with Duff. And I'm going to try to, to go through this reasonably quickly. But when you think about producing tag PDF, um, I was talking to Duff about you know, how I might approach this topic. And one of the questions was, well, you know, if I'm a, an author of PDF, if I'm creating some software that generates PDF or manipulates PDF, what do I have to be aware of to make sure that it comes out the other end as a good tagged PDF or a good, well, or at least a syntactically correct tagged PDF? Um, because there's an element of, of correctness that, that only humans at the moment can actually validate. And so we've already talked about the fact that the content can come in any order. And so you have to segment your content into marked content sequences. Those marked content sequences have to be in reading order. You have to produce logical structure for the document. You have to define what that is. Um, you have to provide content alternatives, alt text and things like that for the content that, that is very visual oriented or, or, or inaccessible. You have to map the roles from the logical structure to the, the standard types that we already spoke about. Um, it's very important to specify language, as we saw when the uh, when you know screen readers are reading this content. The pronunciation of different languages is, is incredibly uh, uh, you know hard to capture. If you don't specify language, you'll start reading German with an English accent, and uh, I won't try, <laughs> but it, it sounds terrible. Um, and then you have to make sure that the content is unamb unambiguously defined, so that you actually have uh, uh, something you can extract as Unicode. Um, you know, I've already shown you this example, but this kind of uh, looks a little bit differently. 
um, you know, if we have the content out of order, out of sequence, um, we have to identify those content blocks that we're interested in. We have to um, put some structure in place. Um, and I don't know, can I use this mouse? So you know, it turns out that these are actually in incorrect reading order. Uh, the example that I've been showing is Hello World, Goodbye Universe. Um, but it turned out it was easier for me, for whatever reason, to write those backwards. So I have to be able to identify those so that they can later be, um, be identified in the correct logical reading order. And I think we've, we've talked this a few times, but it's the reading order on the page is not important, except when you're in one of these marked content sequences, one of these, these blocks here, then it becomes very important that content is in reading order. And the reason for that is, you, you can't guess, you don't want to be reliant on doing um, you know, X, Y orderings and, and things like that to try to guess the, the content order. So when you're within a marked content sequence, as it's called, um, then you have to put your content out in reading order. But outside of those, they can appear in any order they want and you rely on the logical stretch tree to rebuild the correct reading order. Um, how do you actually do content assignment? Well. How do you do content assignment? So, Duff's already spoken to this, but all real content on the page should be in the logical structure tree. And all content, regardless of whether it's real or otherwise, should be, in, should be marked either as structure, uh, structured content or artifact. There should be nothing that appears on a page that isn't put into one of those two categories. It's either in the logical structure or it's an artifact. There cannot be, it cannot be both and it cannot be neither. Yeah. Um, all content must be assigned, even if it's rendered off screen and is never actually going to get printed, if it's, if it's outside a clipping boundary, that doesn't matter. You still have to unambiguously identify it because you shouldn't be reliant on someone rendering your document to understand whether text is actually part of the content. And I just wanted to show some examples, and this is something that uh, Faras actually uh, kind of distributed out and very kindly allowed me to put in here, which is, you know, so. This is how you identify a logically structured block of content. The, you have a tag a name, which happens to match what it is in the structure tree, but it doesn't really matter because the structure tree identifies the type. You give it a unique uh, identifier for the page, so you have to give it an ID. Uh, it doesn't matter if you reuse IDs across pages, but for each page it must be unique. So I can use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on page 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on page 2, but I can't do 0, 1, 1, 2 on, 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 one, on any single page. Um, content that is logically structured, part of the structure tree, cannot also be an artifact. As I say, you cannot be both. So, so, and, and vice versa, artifacts cannot be part of the logical structure. So basically, you have to be one or the other. And I just wanted to highlight that here because this is something that's not necessarily fully uh, understood from a simple reading of ISO 32000 part 1. So Duff already did a fantastic job of, of talking about artifacts, and I don't want to kind of overlap too much. But you know, it's not always obvious what constitutes an artifact. Um, when you look at this page, there's obviously printer's marks that are, are going to be artifacts. They're not part of the reading order of that page. They're not part of the real content. Uh, and real content is a defined term that's actually used in ISO 32000. Um, the running header, the image of the, the cyclist, is also not um, uh, real content. It's, it's just a, an artifact of the system to, to make the document look pretty. We also have running headers and, uh, and, and such, and, and those are not content. Those are um, artifacts of the system that's generated by publishing. Um, somewhere on a previous page, those might have been headers or they might have been the document title. On this page, they're just um, visual artifacts that we use when we're reading a document visually to, to give us some context and can be determined from the structure tree. You don't need this information when you're reading from logical structure. And there's some arbitrary art on the page that's used to kind of make it look nice that is also an artifact. What about these? Well, Duff already pointed this out, but it's not the tables that are uh, not content, but the backgrounds behind them. They're not actually content. They're a visual artifact we use to um, help a sighted user access the content of the document but they are not part of the actual logical content of that document. Um, let's expand the, the top uh, paragraph. Well, actually, this has a surprising number of artifacts in it, and I think this is something that Def didn't describe, which is 
We have a lot of uh, hyphens that are generated as part of the typography algorithm. They're not part of the content. They're not something you would expect to read. A sighted reader just automatically removes those and, and combines the word back. But reading software doesn't know whether to do that or not. So these would all have to be marked as artifacts. If we look at the image at the bottom... Could, could they also be... Uh, what if they had two Unicode mappings to uh, soft hyphens in Unicode? That would probably be okay, but they're not really content. They're, they're, they're an artifact of printing that system. They're, they're an H and J algorithm has basically gone through and decided that this word doesn't fit, and the only way I can do it is to split it. And so I've done some algorithms to do that. It's an artifact of typesetting. This would it be acceptable to use, uh, in your view, to since uh, there is a soft hyphen concept in Unicode? I would argue no, not unless that soft hyphen was an intentional uh, authored concept. Um, so you, should, you should tell some people at Adobe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not I'm not suggesting Adobe has this all perfect either. Um, the bottom image. Um, there's also some potential artifacts here, and this is where it gets a little bit more ambiguous. We actually have two artifacts here. We have another one of those soft hyphens. And we also have a number for the images. And it turns out that, although you can't see it in this page of the document, but on each page, each image has a caption, and that caption um, is numbered. Is that content or is it not? Technically, it's an artifact of the system. But it could be something that we rely on to refer to content in the document. Look at the first image on the page. So this is the first hint that it's not always... Um, although the soft hyphen question was an interesting one, this is something where it's ambiguous, whether you would mark that as content or artifact. What it really comes down to is, what are you trying to convey to the, to the processing software that's going to be reading this document aloud or is going to be putting this into a database somewhere or, or, or doing some work with it? Um, I would probably mark that, and we actually have mechanisms in type PDF to mark that as, as a label, and that might get you around that system. That, that might be the, the answer there. May I, may I get in between? So I, I, I've been dealing with this Don't for a while, back. and I'm, I'm sorry? I said, do you want me to go back to this page? Or? Yeah, that's... Uh, and I'm, I'm not, not yet, I have to say, uh, an accessibility <coughs> expert. I'm, I'm working hard, but it will take a while. Uh, but I'm talking to other people who are, are much less of an expert than I am, and I, I try to make them understand what I think I've already understood. <clears throat> and in cases like this, in a normal person, some kind of production context, whether that's a secretary writing a small brochure for a small company or a production agency or media service provider, doesn't matter. Um, they have limited resources. So they are supposed not to spend one hour thinking about this uh, one <laughs> caption. Uh, and, and they are looking for advice. They're, they're willing to learn, uh, yeah. but they need some advice. So what is a good direction? Well, and and yeah. my take would always be, um, in this case, um, just keep it. Because having the number here doesn't hurt. So a blind person or uh, use of a, a limited sight or whatever will not be disturbed no. by the number being there and will not, not say, uh, oh, that's painful. <laughs> um, because if everything else is fine, that, that doesn't matter at all. Uh, and, 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 and it might provide value, and it's not obvious whether it might provide value, but in, in this case it says figure uh, in the top bottom, uh, in the bottom right. So it's referring to it by location, which is actually to rather say uh, figure one, because then you could actually say, well, there's some figure that is a caption with a number one. Yes. So my, my trend would be, uh, just keep in, in, in the question art, artifact with the real content. Keep it as real content as long as you're sure it doesn't hurt. Yes. If it's obviously uh, some artifact content, then take it as artifact. Yeah. And I think what it really comes down to is there's there's obviously um, a number of points in a chain where um, this 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 PDF was produced. And um, let's say I, not that I could produce this in Microsoft Word, but let's say I was using Microsoft Word as just a, a tool that. I, as a business user, am familiar with. I'm not into the high-end print industry. I don't, I don't really use the, the super high-end tools. Um, you know, really, if I'm putting numbers onto documents, I'm probably doing this automatically. I've probably set up some style in my, uh, probably, <laughs> certainly not guaranteed. But you know, I'm, I've probably set up a style in Word that says, you know, auto number my, my images, restart on each page. You know, when the software, whichever software that is, it might be um, Word itself is converting it to PDF, you know, some of these things can be done reasonably automatically and reasonably intelligently, and it kind of, you, you don't want to put, the, the author has to have a role in determining the semantics and the structure. But we've already seen with tagging systems, uh, as in, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
in, in file systems or when you have to tag your images um, through photography software, that getting users to do that reliably and consistently is, is not something you can do. And so having the system make a decision and, and do that and helping that way is, is also important. So for people who are writing the authoring software, they should be considering how to do a better job of, of, of automating this so the user doesn't have to make that complex decision. But I agree, if, 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 there's a, if there's a question of its value or not and you think you, it leans to that this could have value and you're not sure, it's better to have it than to discard it. So once you've done all that page segmentation, so we've identified the real content and we've identified the artifacts and we think we've got it just right, hopefully in software that's done most of the work for me, um, I then have to build a logical structure. And this is actually quite hard, deciding on the right structure of a document. And again, I talked to this later in the talk, but um, it's not always obvious what, which tags you should use and which you shouldn't or what they mean. Um, but you need to have some sort of document structure that indicates the actual, um, you know, sort of the higher levels of the document, chapters, articles, potentially sub-documents and things like that. Um, and then you need to basically associate the, the structure tree with these marked content sequences. And so I haven't actually shown the exact mechanism for it here. Um, it's very obvious when you read the specification how to do it. But basically, I at this, this, on this P node have said, now this has this content. And I've identified that MCID1 is its content. And so that's how I associate um, structure to the content. And it's, and it's a very nice mechanism because it's completely standoff. That has some advantages, which means you're not reliant on, on arbitrary content or mechanisms to, to define semantics. And it's actually one of the things that HTML doesn't do very well. Um, that HTML, if you're reliant on, on the tagging, on the actual uh, XML or, or HTML markup, um, isn't going to do a lot of work for giving you a separate logical representation from a, a visual representation. Um, I'm, I don't think I need to describe this in too much detail, but you have to think about appropriate alternate text for your images. So here I have a scene of one of the, the bridges in, in, in Basel. Um, it's um, a, a photo of one of the bridges, and so I wanted to, to make sure, I have, I've put a caption here, but um, this caption is really intended to, to conceptualize the, the alt text, what I might write if I were to describe this. You've got to put something descriptive enough that it's useful to people, but not too descriptive that it's, um, you don't want every time you hit that image to have a thousand line description of what every pixel looks like. So there's, a, there's an element of judgment value and uh, human choice there that computers don't necessarily get right. You also need to make sure that you have captions for things like tables, figures, and lists whenever appropriate. Um, and finally, I've already talked about this mechanism, but you, know, you can have very rich logical structures. And even if you haven't got a rich logical structure, your system that you've used to typeset your document may have its own notations that it uses. And here we clearly have something that's come from Microsoft Word. <laughs> and it's, it's used styles, and the person has used a lot of styles to, to lay out the document. And they've done so in some ways logically, but actually some ways stylistically. And this isn't a good document semantics. Um, but what I'm trying to highlight here is that you have to take your complex structure and map it to this simple standard structure. And this is where document interchange can happen. And so it turns out that I have a lot of things that map to paragraphs. Actually, this is terrible. This, this, these should be mapping to headings. But I wanted to capture a real world example because you know, the mistakes like this are made. And, and this is why it's really important that, 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 that uh, software starts to get better at producing these things. But what it does show is that there are many things that map down to spans, uh, multiple things that map to figures. Um, but what it means is that I have a reliable base set of information that I can use in my processing software later to, to get some information that I can understand, even if I don't know what a colorful list accent 11 is. Because um, I, I have really no idea what that is as a semantic concept. Um, and, and, and that's the biggest problem that we faced with logical structure, was that when you have large arbitrary structures and you give it to someone else, they don't have a clue what it means. Um, again, Dust spoke pretty much to this, and so I don't think I need to go into too much detail. You want to identify it for a document its primary language. Um, not all documents have a primary language. It might be um, a, a, a user manual where it has an equal amount of English, French, and German. <laughs> 
But if a document has a primary language, you should identify it for the whole document. But then in the few cases, for example, this is in Vietnamese, but where I actually have a, 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 some strings in English, I can use the logical structure to identify the language for the s small parts of the document that are in a different language. This means that my reading software can read most of the body content here in Vietnamese. But when it switches to English, it will switch its pronunciation to use the English system and, and will sound more correct to the, to the user. Um, and there's a good talk, I think, happening later today about fonts and, and, and content, and so I don't want to, to overlap too much. But um, there are many forms of font that can be put into PDF. And we have lots of choices in how we subset them and the amount of information in those fonts as to what they really mean. But the intent of most fonts is not to describe themselves semantically. It's intended to get a glyph being displayed at the right place with the right uh, layout. And so it's perfectly common or perfectly normal for me to, to optimize a subset font and uh, take these characters and map them to, to arbitrary ASCII values. Now, in ASCII, it's probably not going to be done, but when you start using uh, upper Unicode characters and such, this is really common. In fact, you can't address characters in upper Unicode in, 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 in anything outside of, the, uh, the, of ASCII in PDF content streams themselves. So you have to map them using some mechanism. And so here I've created a little table that kind of shows how I've mapped the characters to perform the actual words Hello world. Um, so it's really important after you've done this that you, you produce a mapping. And the way the mapping works is that you map ranges of values to ranges in the Unicode specification. There's mechanisms for taking ligature characters and expanding them out to their individual characters. So one character on the page does not necessarily correspond to one Unicode character. But you have the mechanism for basically specifying how content is, is associated. And so now a computer processing that software can unambiguously identify the, the content and read it, or at least process it as, as, as real text. Um, and we've already talked about this to some extent. Where, where do we even get logical structure information from? And it's, it's really hard to find. It turns out that people are very much into styling content and making it look good, not so much in describing its nature. But Tools like Microsoft Word and InDesign and, 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 and uh, that scale from really low end to really high end publishing have got better over time at identifying things in a way that kind of does a bit of both. And so it turns out that in Microsoft Word, the stylings are, uh, are, are somewhat semantic as well as, as, as layout based. And so when we convert a Microsoft Word document to type PDF, we can get access to that content and we can, we can convert those tags reasonably straightforwardly. It's not always perfect, as, as we've already seen. And I'm not going to really talk about OCR because I think Duff did a much better job of this than I would have done. But basically, you know, if, 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 the, if this document was just an image, you've got to identify the real content, put it into the, into the document in some manner. And a, a common manner for doing this is actually using what's called render mode 3 in, um, in, in, for fonts where you paint, but you don't actually draw or fill, you don't fill or, or, or stroke the actual glyph. So the content's actually within the page, and you can then put that into the logical structure and mark the actual image as an artifact. And when a system that's reading this out loud reads it, you actually get access to the content. But in this case, that image would also have real smaller images that are actually intended to be images. So you have to do some work to leave those in place and to pull them out and put them back into the document. And visually, you need to leave the whole thing intact because you don't want to do it. So there are some challenges when you, uh, when you do OCR and documents, getting logical structure in there. But it can be done. It's just it's hard and requires human interaction. So we're running out of time. So um, now I'll get to the bit that I think Olaf really wants me to talk about, <laughs> which is the challenges that have faced us. So, so I've talked a little bit about the history, or a lot about the history, and sort of how you do this. But is it, is it right? Does it work? So document interchange. I've used that term a lot. You know, when you, the whole point of PDF is so that you can exchange documents. And we have lots of subset standards that help um, exchange in specific domains, print, accessibility, um, archival. But you have to tag PDF so that you actually have good semantics. And it, I could say all the content in a page is a paragraph. That's not right, but it would be syntactically valid. So there's a lot more to tagging PDF than just putting content into a structure tree. It's about identifying the nature of that content accurately. And, and that's hard, and I'll get to that in a minute. It's also 
we, you know, clearly we've discussed this already. Authoring these documents is a challenge because there's, there's not necessarily always that information present in the system and you somehow have to put that into this, this PDF and tag it appropriately. The current tag set doesn't address the issues of domain specific languages at all. If I have musical notation or chemical symbols into, in, in a PDF, there's no markup at the moment that would give me any information about that in the standard structure tag set. And uh, we have in ISO 32000 Part 2 added math. But that opens the door to, well, how many other domain-specific uh, languages do we need to add? And so one of the things we've wanted to do is address that issue. And you know, there's an actual ad hoc committee uh, for ISO 32000 that's been ta uh, tasked with investigating these issues and trying to come up with proposals to, to resolve them, and which is what I'm actually going to, to talk about. And so the biggest challenge I think that we, we face is what is a document? <laughs> Yeah, documents are incredibly complex, and they, they span a huge range of different uh, document types. Uh, we have classic multi-page but small business documents. They're probably authored in Microsoft Word. We have journals that are complicated, but mainly in terms of their, their semantic nature. I, I actually I should have put it in here, but obviously you have publishing. I mean, that's a, that's a huge one where you have these very print-focused documents, but you, you still want to retain and exchange uh, in a non-print context. Uh, and, and PDFs can be for parking tickets or for bank statements. You've got a very broad range of, of, of document types. How do we come up with a clear, consistent semantics that's, that's flexible enough to address all these, but not so complex that it's impossible to ever apply? And, and that's, that's one of the things that we've been, been trying to um, address. On the right, I'm not expecting anyone to read this list, but those are the list of all the tags that can occur in ISO 32000 Part 2. Um, it includes most all of the ones from 32,000 Part 1, plus a few extras that we, we've added as, as part of uh, uh, Part 2. I didn't bother expanding all the math tags. Um, there's the full range of MathML 3.0 presentational uh, tags that you could use, but I didn't see the point of cluttering this page with, with, with far more tags. If you, as a, I mean, if you just imagine yourself in the case of sitting down with a document, when do you use these things? You know, when do you decide that something is um, uh, 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 a redaction? Well, that's probably reasonably easy. When I have a table, why do I have table rows, heads, and, and, and data, and then a separate T head, T body, T foot you know, construct? Why would I ever use those? So one of the things that's been identified is we've kind of taken this scattershot approach to tagging in the past, where someone said, oh, I have a problem. I have this specific content I want to tag. I need this tag to do it with. But what we haven't done is think about it in a consistent and, and, uh, and, and you know, expansive way. We think, well, what do we really need to get out of document semantics? And, and this committee is an ISO 32000 committee, so we're not just looking at accessibility, although obviously that plays a, a big part in our, in our thinking, but also content reuse and reflow and all the other topics that go along with this. Um, and, and, and our decision um, is really that we have too much. We have far more than we need for the average simple document. And it turns out that accessibility software, so there's two problems here. One is that the documents that are out in the wild, uh, and we've heard numbers like 1% or 3% of tag PDF, that's actually a little more alarmist than is, is true. For new documents being processed today, being, being authored today, about 30% are tag PDF. Um, that doesn't mean they're good tag PDF. It just means that 30% claim to have uh, a, a structure tree in it. Um, but trying to get that so that it's, it's more consistent, trying to get it rich enough that accessibility software can rely on it to not just be present but accurate to some extent and, and usable, that's, that's a much harder problem. So we've decided we're going to reduce the tag set to a much more usable set. We haven't defined what that set is yet. We have some suggestions. I almost put them in, the, in this presentation where I decided that really the important takeaway is we're going to reduce the complexity of this. Um, we want to make it really easy to make the choice of what, a t what tag I should use in a given context. So at the moment, you know, I have documents and I have parts and I have articles and I have sections and I have divs and I have all these different structures which don't really make sense in, in general documents. And so what, I'm trying to, what we're trying to do in this committee is to reduce it to a usable set that's really intuitive to apply. Um, and given how hard it is to map really complex sets of, of tags to the current set, we're not losing a lot by reducing it, I, I don't believe. 
Um, what we're trying to do is make it so that assistive technology can rely on our tags and can make full use of every tag in the system, rather than at the moment only being able to rely on maybe headings um, and, and paragraphs and a, and a few other things. Um, and that's really all accessibility software does. Paragraphs, lists, headings, tables, very, very few things that it can navigate by. We want to open up PDF to allow more navigational capabilities, more access to the content, and we want to do it in a consistent way. Um, but we don't want to stop people who have their rich tag sets from still utilizing those. And it occurs to us that, you know, at the moment it's really hard to do document interchange of complex tag sets. But people do want to do that. And we don't want to have just closed systems where, you know, my company puts some arbitrary complex um, tag set in and then sends it to another, you know, partner. And they're the only people who can understand this. You know, we want to do this in a way that says, you know, I'm making it very clear what my tag set is. You can choose whether you want to, to utilize it. So how are we doing this? Well, we're looking at XML. And we're saying that yeah, it has some really good concepts in terms of namespacing and identifying schema and, 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 and such for describing complex sets of documents. There's a lot that already exists, and it would be wrong of the ISO committee to think that we can reinvent every scheme that already exists. So what we would like to do is make more use of that. And I think I have a slide later that talks just a little bit more about how we might use that. Um, and we want to make it so that the PDF standard, as well as having this minimal set that I've already talked about, perhaps incorporates some very common domain-specific languages like math, but doesn't try to be too exhaustive, but allows the industry to, to specify the common and most useful uh, sets. And, and we would like to allow third parties to do that, to, to choose what they need to exchange, but to do so in a manner that other companies can reliably identify and reuse. Um, I don't want to bore everyone with uh, too much information about how we intend to do namespaces, but um, we're, we're thinking of adding a new namespace kind of global thing to, to, to the structure tree, which basically allows you to say, this document uses these namespaces. And um, those namespaces will describe what they are. They'll have a mapping to some sort of schema document, uh, probably an actual real W3C uh, schema or, or some real XNG component. We don't intend to reinvent all that, I don't think. Um, and we want to allow it so that they can ID it and that they can map this complex schema, if they choose, back to the standard types so that it can at least be consumed at a minimal level. And then every structure element can choose to identify which namespace it's in. It doesn't have to. If it's just in the global namespace and we'll have a default, that's fine. But if it's in a separate, if it's in the math namespace or in the chemistry namespace, then we want every tag to be able to identify that so it can be used. So, okay, I've reached the end of the, the presentation, and, and hopefully this, this wasn't too um, blue sky or, or too outside the realms of practicality, but um, one thing that's clear is the technicalities of tagging are really well defined and easy to understand, but they're very hard to, to get right and to get the semantics right, and it's always hard to find that information. So, so it's not always going to be possible to produce a perfect PDF UA document. And one thing I want to point out is that uh, while there is always going to be um, a, a, a groups that need perfect PDF UA, government bodies, large enterprises, whoever it is who chooses they need that for their workflows, um, that doesn't mean that if you can't get 100% that you shouldn't do 80% or you shouldn't try. You know, it, it's important that we get this at least partially right and the more information we have present, the better the quality of PDF is going to be, the better the job we can do with accessibility and so um, you know, don't give up when you don't get 100%. You know, if, if, you're, if, if your process can only get 80%, well, no, you shouldn't mark it as a PDF UA compliant document, but it's still worth putting that information into the system. And we have a long way to go before we're going to get it to the 100% of new documents that we'd like. We're never going to go back to the entire <laughs> backlog of documents and put it in there. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Any questions? Uh, uh, regarding uh, the standards, uh, as I have learned, PFA is more or less a subset uh, of PDF UA. Yeah. So what would be the recommendation to have an accessible PFA, let's say 2A document? Which processes would you, would you uh, recommend? 
I mean, so, so maybe I'm not entirely understanding. I mean, so there is a large overlap between the PDFA specification and the PDF UA specification. And one of the important aspects of the subset standards is you don't have to choose just one. You can be a PDF uh, X document and also be compliant, com can be compliant with PDFA. That's not always true. If it's a PDF VT document, for example, with um, external reference X objects, that can never be an archivable PDF because it requires all the content be present within the document. So um, there is a, a large overlap between um, PDF uh, A1A and PDF UA. And the, the idea is that actually you should probably meet both. And, and I think Duff already pointed out that if you are a fully PDF UA compliant document, um, you, you have gone most of the way to being a PDF A compliant document. And so um, I, I don't know offhand if there are any really small, subtle differences. Maybe Duff has a better answer. But you should be aiming to actually be both. <clears throat> Mostly it's a PDFA is very vague and unspecific about the requirements for achieving conformance level A. Yes. A PDF UA goes into great detail and specifies um, really for each of the significant PDF features what it is you have to do, what it is you, you should not do, you shall not do, you should do, you should do, all kinds of specifications at each, each feature level. PDFA conformance level A kind of says you have to have tags and make sure they're good. And it doesn't go far beyond that. Yeah. So PDF UA is, is, is more strict, has more requirements. Um, but in the main part, a, a fully PDF UA compliant document should be reasonably PDF A compliant. I, I don't want to say 100% with that. Yeah, but, so <laughs> you can have interactive features in PDF UA, and they are usually prohibited in PDF A. But apart from that, um, a, a decent PDF UA document is also easy to, to save as a PDF A document. Yeah. So you first go from more intelligent to less intelligent? I, I think ideally you would start with the creation process and just make sure you have a rich PDF already with all the tags in place in, in, in some good way and, and then get as close to PDF UA conformant as you can for the tags and <coughs> as close as possible to PDF A conformant on kind of the content level and, and, uh, and rendering level um, of that. And um, so ideally you, you would be using any whatever tool you're using that kind of produces almost PDFA and PDFUA conformance already, and either it, it just can do it and just export as PDFA and, and UA, or some process after the creation process is kind of adding the, the last bits that make, make, makes the file fully conforming. And we are considering, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think we've come up with any real conclusion on how to make it clear what the differences are between the, sta the subset standards and how to achieve sort of um, equivalence or, or how to ensure that a PDF UA document is a PDF A document. We haven't done that yet, but, but that's certainly on the radar as something that we think is important. It, it's really about the inter interactive uh, yeah. aspects that are fully okay in PDF UA, so you can have a movie mm -hmm. inside, the PDF UA doesn't stop you from doing that, um, and it would not be okay in PDF A. But apart from that, like quality of encoded content, uh, it's almost the same because we borrowed a lot of the stuff from, from PDF A. Uh, the fonts and so on is, is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the two s systems are, you know, can be compliant, uh, they, they are. They, in terms of, you know, wh where we've allowed specific things in PDF UA, like the interactive features, well, we, we know that they're not PDFA compliant. But for every other aspect that overlaps, we've made sure that they are uh, a good match so that you can define, of the two formats, the overlap's huge. And there's a small amount on the outside of, of PDF UA that is, is, is not compliant. You can even uh, achieve conformance of PDFX for printing, PDFA for archiving, and PDFUA at the same time. There's no reason not to, no technical reason. And even aspects of PDFVT, if you don't use the... Uh, As a special case of PDFX. Yeah. So technically, there's no reason not, not to do everything at the same time. In the real world, there might be reasons to only focus on, on one or two. Any other questions? Then I think it's a um, good time. Oh. No, it's, it's not a question, it's more or less, you, you brought this in a very good context for PDF, but as we know, there's Word outside, there's a lot of other IT systems outside. Are there any things going on in other worlds that deal with the same problem? Because there's, on, on, on the cloud side, you have all these, these big 
big databases and store that, then you have the semantic web enriching text with additional meta information. So this is what, what, what I see is going on outside. So now I try to bring these together because universal <coughs> access is not, not just for disabled people, it's really probably also the rest of the stuff. Do you have any ideas, thoughts, how that collaborates? I or? think one of the reasons why perhaps we haven't looked too much into that is PDF, because of its uh, content nature, because of the, it's, it's a print-oriented format, has a lot of issues that, that have to be addressed. Now, as we've already described in this, that PDF does that. It's actually a very accessible format if you use it correctly. But because of that, we've had to focus very much on the, the typesetting artifacts and the issues that, that, that you see. Um, many of the systems that, that are out there for, for, for the cloud or for document workflows tend to be content driven. And the content's actually in a reasonably sort of good Unicode format but in the system. And so we, I guess it, it's a different enough domain. We, we've thought that we haven't looked too closely at the sort of relationships between those. We have, of course, looked at WorkHack 2.0 and things like that to understand, in fact, very heavily looked at WorkHack 2.0 to understand the general requirements of accessibility, um, but not the, not, not the specific you know, issues that might be in one workflow, one system. But aren't you saying if you want to create this PDF UAE compatibility that all the other guys have to think about that because they have the logics in their business processes in the way how, how they store the information. So I think you cannot reach your goals without bringing them yes. into the boat or into the overall discussion. The, the, no, that's, that's a we we do have some important companies kind of on board. <clears throat> so Microsoft is actually chairing the PDF UAE committee in ISO, okay. which I think does say something. Uh, they have lots of things to do, and if they, if they are not interested in, in UA, they will be sitting there, that's for sure. Um, and I also, have, um, I also think a lot of other people and companies are, are watching. There are some who should be watching on, and are not, so we really are missing Google and Apple at the desk, mm -hmm. uh, at the table in, in, in our ISO meetings. <clears throat> that's especially sad as Apple has done a few things that are really uh, laudable. It's really good stuff. Um, um, Voiceover, both on, on, on the desktop systems as well as on the mobile systems. It's, it's really cool stuff, but it, it, it fails with PDF. <laughs> so it's very good in the browser and email programs and in the general uh, um, uh, environment, but it's, it's almost dead once you get inside a PDF file. And it's so sad because PDF is the rendering model of, of the whole operating system. So it's, it's, it's at the core of, 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 of the Apple operating systems. And it's, it's, I find it very sad. But the stuff is happening. And I think we have to prove that it can be done with reasonable effort. And I, I really, I, I think I know, but I have to say I hope that, that Adobe and Microsoft can, can prove the case. And it's with, with reasonable effort, you can enable a user inside the tool, inside Word, Excel, uh, InDesign, whatever, um, to just do a few extra things to the document and then have a, a very nice, very well-tagged, um, accessible PDF that you can then, in, with, with all rights, call a PDF UA file. And it may take another, I don't know, m some months, maybe a year or two, but I think between now and the end of ne next year, the, the world will be different in this regard. And then you can start to create some pressure because it's not just for blind people that you're adding value. There's, you're, you're adding overall value. And I think once people are beginning to understand that it's, that it's not that much work to get it done, yeah, developers have to prepare, prepare the tools accordingly, users have to take advantage of the tools, the tools have to be refined to make it easier and so on. But once you get there, um, an inter interesting mental change is happening. And I think that will kind of, that will, that will cause the landslide. Not, maybe not, not this year, but maybe end of next year, maybe the year after, but it's not uh, five years away. That's my personal uh, perception of what's going on at this moment. And I, I would add that the, um, you know, the, the purpose of the standard was in part to address your concern, you know, uh, in, or, in order to, to help uh, implementers to uh, doing other things in other formats to be able to communicate into the PDF UA world. They, uh, you know, the question before them is, we're, we want to make accessible PDF files. Do we go look at WCAG 2.0 and start rolling the dice and taking and making guesses, or do we get something that's actually tech, or do we go look at something that's very technically specific that gives us a point by point PDF feature by PDF feature way to address the problem? And in fact, you know the information uh, the PDFs can you know contain a world of arbitrary documents and it's extraordinarily broad and difficult space in order to answer all of these questions in. 
so that the UA document took a particular tack, which is to say walk through PDF feature by feature and describe what's necessary here or there. There are doubtless many other ways in which the document, or additional ways, not other, but additional ways, in which the document could have been developed to increase the likelihood that, that other implementers will be able to understand how their own systems, AFP or, or whatever it is, could relate to this sort of thing. Um, and that is the kind of thing that we could, you know, I know as a, as a chairman of the US Committee for PDFUA, I'm always very, 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 you know, encouraging every implementer with any interest in this subject to come to the table and help us work on PDFUA too, so that we can increase the, the volume of information that answers, you know, core implement, implementation questions uh, from the get-go. And, and, and also the good thing is a lot of stuff is already there. It's not that you start at, at, at zero. So if you look at some of the libraries that allow you to create PDF files, which are widely used in the industry, whether that's uh, PDFLib from, from PDFLib in, in Munich, or it's uh, the Adobe PDF library, or some yeah. of the other tools. Thank you, Leonard. Um, so right just let you know, this is all the food that's left. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I you guys might as well just keep lunch. talking. Uh, We've eaten all of the lunch. Okay. So, so anyway, the, the, the tool set is there for developers, for example. So if you're creating content on the fly from, from content you have in your database, it's not that you have to invent everything. You could look at the um, uh, SDK from PDF, Adobe, and, and others, and the, the calls are there to not just create visible content, but also to, to create tags around it. And I think it's relatively, relatively straightforward once you understand your own content, once you know where your headings are, so to speak. Um, then it's, you just add the stuff uh, when, you, when you create the file. And so it can be done, but guidance was lacking, and I think that that kind of guidance is to a high degree now provided by PDF UA. Yeah. And, and I think when you look at you know, content management systems, and, and I'm no expert on, on that side of the thing, but you know, they tend to have a lot of rich information in them. And when you're compositing that into an actual document format yeah. that you're going to disseminate, you know, it, it, it's actually probably more, um, the, it, it comes down to, well, how do I map my probably much richer kind of semantics into this? Hopefully, PDF UA gives that guidance, and hopefully, ISO 32000 gives the general syntax requirements for doing that. Um, okay, thanks, Matthew. Time for lunch.